Good evening, everybody. It is me again. It's World War II TV, and we're going to talk about the events of 75 years ago on the border with Germany. And to join me, direct from the USA, is Alex Kershaw, World War II TV regular. How are you doing, Alex? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Excited about this one. So um, I'll let Alex talk in a minute, but basically we're talking about the events that were covered in episode three of The Liberator, the amazing series on Netflix that... Uh, the, it took a bit of getting used to that first episode of the style, but once I got into the, you know, 10 minutes in, it, it, it was fine. So um, we're talking about what was happening uh, 75 years ago. So explain the situation of the 45th Division and what was going on um, in January 75 years ago. Uh, well, Felix Sparks, who's the liberator, um, he's the subject of the, the Netflix series. Um, there he is uh, with his wife. Uh, he was a um, joined the 45th um, in 1941 and was a lieutenant. And by God, by January uh, today, in fact, of 1945, he had been in combat for well over 300 days. He um, led E Company from the 157th Infantry Regiment of the Thunderbird Division. He led them in in uh, combat since Salerno in 1943, September 1943. So he was a very experienced um, officer in the 157th Infantry Regiment, one of the three that belonged to the Thunderbird Division. And he found himself in the Vosges Mountains in a um, uh, pressing today, actually his battalion, he was a battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel by today in uh, 1945. And he was in the Vosges Mountains and he pushed his Battalion, the third battalion of the 157th Infantry Regiment. He pushed pushed them, uh, and they forward, and they took a ridge um, just outside Reipersweiler, um, about a mile. There you can see, yeah, look. Um, yeah. So uh, Rhine tantalizingly in the distance on the border of Germany. Vosges Mountains, very bitter, difficult, horrible fighting, um, and. Unfortunately, the um, little did he know, but the Germans launched Operation Northwind, Nordwind, which was perhaps their last really concerted attack on the Western Front. Um, last, really, the last kind of pathetic gasp of uh, of Hitler's regime and the Western Front. Uh, but unfortunately, part of the forces of Operation Northwind were were pretty good. I mean, they were SS veterans and one of the divisions that um, was employed in Operation Northwind was the 6th SS Division. And they'd been in um, in Finland uh, basically up until New Year's Eve, about two weeks ago. And they were brought in and they were, they were, they were seasoned troops. They were hard, they were, they were very good on the ground and they were merciless. Oh, that's a very nice, Thank you, Paul. That's very nice of you yep. to share that Bit image. Of a for you. Uh, anyway, cut on the story short. Um, the 6th SS, the 11th um, SS Infantry Regiment of that division surrounded Sparks' battalion, um, some 700, 800 guys who were uh, based along a ridge in positions that stretched about two-thirds to a mile um, along this ridge and they uh, cut off his battalion from Sparks and over about a week from the 17th of, um, they, was, they were cut off actually on the 17th of January. So it's the 15th of January today. The regiment was cut off um, from supporting troops in the 45th and the 157th. It was cut off on the 17th. And then on the uh, 22nd, it was completely uh, surrounded um, decimated. I think there were over 200 um, men killed. The rest of them, all but two from that battalion of 800 were captured or wounded. So uh, I think just two guys from the, the battalion actually made it back to Allied lines uh, to report to Sparks. So it was like a, a really bitter, uh, bitter blow for Sparks. It, was a, it showed you that the war in January 1945, outside of the Ardennes, um, was a very, very fiercely fought, and that the Germans were not to be underestimated, especially when they decided to attack through very, very difficult terrain 
in horrible conditions, mm. they could still kick kick our ass very very badly. Yeah, and, and Ripers, Ripers Valley is the perfect example of that. You know, I was just going to jump in and say that the problem I think we all have as as students of military history is we kind of take our timeline. We can only kind of deal with one campaign at a time. And the problem is yeah. it always means there's one happening at the same time that gets yeah. second um, attention. And, of course, yeah. the Battle of the Bulge over in Yardens is still raging when this is happening. And so all yeah. of our focus tends to be on what's happening over there in Baston and Hoofalese and over there. And this event, which is miles and miles further east, kind of gets overlooked. You get the same thing about when there's things happening in uh, in Market Garden, when there's other things happening yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. and And... You know, I'm, I'm going off the back of the Liberator TV show because I watched it this afternoon in my prep for this. It was so easy. I didn't have to read a book, just sat and put the TV on. It was great. Oh, Is that no. Felix Sparks had this sense that the, the situation was going to get was going to get bad. I mean, that that's all true, isn't it? I mean, he 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 is a very savvy commander because he's been through some pretty shitty situations. Things in Anzio weren't great. Things in Salerno weren't great. He's kind of got a really good um, sort of radar for bullshit yeah. operations, hasn't he? So you, you, know, yeah. you, you met him and you talked to him. So what was what was going through his mind before this battle kicked off? Because you've kind of given a run through of the, uh, of the of the events of it. But he moves into these mountains really suspicious something was going to happen, isn't he? Yeah, well, he felt that um, if he was going to place a battalion, if he was going to place his battalion um, all along the ridge line, he, he wanted some support for that battalion. He wanted reserves, and he wanted very importantly, he wanted massive artillery support if he could get it. He just he just wanted those guys that were exposed. He felt that um, they could be pinched really easily at, uh, on the eastern and western side of that ridge. That they were, uh, they were very vulnerable, and um, he he had problems with it, and he and he reported to. Um, his regimental commander and that re the regimental commander O'Brien reported up the line to uh, General Frederick, who was the 45th Division commander, saying, "You know, we're, we're exposed here. If, if, if the Germans do attack, uh, then then we've got problems. We, we're, we're pushing too far, too hard. We, if we're going to go that far, we need to have support." And, and he didn't. And you know, uh, Sparks's instincts were borne out. And you know, Anzo he lost 200 guys. His company, he was E com Company commander. And he was one of only, um, remarkably, this isn't this isn't fiction, but you know, at Anzio, he he was the only one of only two survivors from E Company, mm. as you said, Paul, that was surrounded by the Germans at Anzio and wiped out. And Sparks managed with a few other guys to escape the encirclement, and got back to his lines, and there was another guy there, a supply sergeant called Leon Sear, who was killed in the breakout from Anzio later on. So two survivors, one later killed. That made Sparks, the company commander at Anzio, the only guy to survive. So he was, you know, brutalized by that and, and heartbroken. And then, you know, January, almost a year later, he's in the same situation, but he's now a battalion commander, four times more guys. And he's got that instinct again, as you say, he's been in combat for an awful long time. He knows when the SHIT is going to hit the fan. Yeah. He can look at the situation. He can, he can assess how his troops are feeling, the, the situation, the terrain, most importantly, the support that his men have got and whether they're going to be exposed in certain positions. And um, so, he, you know, he had that instinct and tragically, you know, he he lost all but two guys again. Yeah. He, 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 he tried his very best. I mean, in the show, which is actually of the four episodes in the Netflix show, the third about Riper's Island, about the Battle of Riper's Island, I think it's the best. Um, and no, I, think I can it's, it's the best, yeah. Yeah, it's for several reasons, but one of the one of the reasons which is really important is that it's actually the most accurate. Um, so, you know, there's not much you can see in the show that didn't actually happen. Um, uh, you know, there's the character Voss. I can show you a picture of him. Actually, I don't know whether you've got him. Um, I don't know. Hang on. I'm going to sh show a picture of him. Um, yeah. You can. Uh... I'll keep on talking while you're finding. I mean, the, the other thing is, as you're talking about his experience, there, he is. there we are. Can you yeah. see him? Yeah, brilliant. So I don't know whether this guy, it's not his real name, Johan Voss. I've forgotten his real name. I wasn't allowed to, to know it for a long time. And I communicated with this guy, Voss. He's from the 11th Infantry Regiment of the 6th SS Division. And, you know, you can see the Black Edelweiss is a book that actually Voss wrote. You can find it on Amazon. It's actually 
really, it's actually probably, I'd say it's probably the most interesting Waffen SS memoir that I've mm -hmm. read. Other people might disagree. And he's got the black Edelweiss, you see on the cap, he's got the black Edelweiss insignia. That's a, a flower that's found up very high up in the, uh, the Tyrol. And um, it's a mountain uh, unit, um, trained in mountain warfare. You got to remember that a lot of guys in Sparks' battalion were replacements and hadn't been trained in mountain warfare. A lot of them didn't even know how to use, uh, fire an M1 rifle properly when they got on the line by this time in the war. Anyway, Voss, I communicated with Voss uh, through an intermediary and I asked him a lot of questions. And uh, he's the guy in the Liberator who's standing, who's sitting there, you know, in his white uh, camouflage uniform and he sees Sparks try and rescue some of his men and he decides not to kill him. Uh, and he said, I, you know, he wrote to me and said, you couldn't, you couldn't kill an officer, a guy like that, who jumped off a tank and tried to save three or four of his wounded men. It was just like, you know, just, we just couldn't do it. It was like, that was, that was not something that I was going to do. So, um, yeah, so that, that part of the episode, when you see the German Voss do that, that's actually based on, uh, on um, a true story as, as well, as much mm. as we know. We know that, we know mm. that Sparks um, wondered why. I, when I interviewed Sparks, he said, I couldn't believe that the SS didn't kill me. Why did not shoot me? So... Uh, Voss provided an answer. They, he was too yeah. much of a hero, too much of a too brave. Which is which is worth acknowledging because we have this. You know, obviously, the SS were, were not very nice people. They're responsible for the Holocaust, but it is worth highlighting occasions when they when they were noble. There perhaps weren't very many of them, but I think it is worth highlighting that there are decent human beings there as well. Um, and this guy is a, is a soldier. And, you know, you, you, you touched on the fact that they're not only are the 45th Division, they're, they're a combination of these cr crusty veterans who are jaded and they're nearing battle fatigue. If not, they've already got battle fatigue. You've got these green kids and they're up against a unit that spent all of its time in Finland who are absolutely yeah. on their game in terms of mountain warfare and camouflage. Oh, and just the, just the equipment, just the fact they've got the white smocks. So, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's, it's Daniel, uh, you know, um, David and Goliath in this situation in some ways, isn't it? And yet he manages to sort of to rally them together. So, you know, as you mentioned this, the show, and you, you know, I think it's the, the, the best of the four episodes. I, I liked as well how well it, de it depicts the terrain. Because yeah. had it been yeah. live action, they've only got two options. They've either got to go to the real location, which would have just been crazy trying to film in the winter, or they've got to fake it in a studio somewhere. But because it was done with the animation, to me, that really, there's two hills. It's Hill oh. 334 and Hill 388, I think it is, you know. And I got a real sense with that sweeping shot of what that terrain was like and that and that road. And that would have been very hard to achieve in real yeah. in real terms, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think they did a great job. Um so I'm just uh, just lifting a, a wee glass of. That's this is, that's uh, fine. I'm going to have my. You know I live in, Paul. You know I live in Savannah, so this is a this is a good Georgian bourbon. Okay. Nice. Yeah. What are you drinking Fair. today? It's watered down already, so that's got. Water okay. In it. I hope so. Otherwise, you're. If um... I had the real stuff, it's like it's like 97 percent proof. Okay. Nice. This is not your not your ordinary. But anyway, sorry, carry on. So, no, so the, the other thing I, w I thought was particularly um, interesting in that show and in, in the real history was that, as you said, Sparks wanted the support. He asked for M8s and tanks to come up. The M8s got blown up. And there's a, there's a, I don't know how, whether this photo is taken exactly the same area, but it is, it is, it is showing a not a vehicle. It is, it is in that area at that time. Yeah. It kind of gives a hint of the terrain. It gives a hint of the problems there on that road. So, had you had you travelled to the Vosges Mountains yourself, Alex? Yeah, I went. To, actually, went to the um, um, the area where the, the battle was fought. I went to Rippersweiler in October of two thousand nineteen. Seems like an awful long time ago now, but it yeah, really when we isn't. could travel, yeah, yeah, <laughs> God, um, yeah. I went in the I went in the fall. I wasn't there in the winter. I don't think I would have been allowed to get into some of the the areas because the roads are all shut in the in that part of the Vosges. But yeah, it was pretty tough terrain. I found um, Sparks's command post um, from where he uh, he um, tried to organise the rescue of his battalion. Um, and I went up the road that you that's in the show where yep. you know, Sparks commandeers the tank and goes up the road to try and rescue his guys, the wounded guys. So I went up there and we tried to find. The, an area where there was a bridge. We tried to find out where Voss, the, the SS machine gunner, was. Um, so yeah, it's pretty, pretty, 
pretty pretty grim territory. Um, and I actually stood right on the ridge line where the battalion were surrounded and kind of had a look around and tried to try to imagine what it would be like in the middle of winter, white white out every night. You're sitting in a foxhole, and um, you know the, that's a very good that's a good um, mm. a good image. That's taken in, in the same area, and that actually shows you what the conditions would have been like during the battle. Those are actually two guys from the 157th Infantry Regiment um, of the Thunderbird Division. So that's a very, the terrain is very like that. It's very steep, frozen leaves, you know, uh, not, not, not too much, not too deep snow, but um, definitely a cold and inhospitable place to fight. And these guys was, were cut off for almost six days and they finally, their radio batteries ran out. Um, they ran out of food and they were methodically picked off by the SS. I mean, they went from one edge and another edge and they, they moved along. So they, so, you know, it got more and more and more terrifying every night. A few more guys would be, would disappear or be killed or shot or throat slit. doesn't matter. Um, so it was a really, it was a, it was a horrible situation to, to find yourself in. And Sparks was absolutely, you know, beside himself with frustration and, um, and anguish, you know, that's why he kind of lost it. He reached a breaking point. He told me that he kind of snapped and had enough. And that's when he commandeered the tank and just did anything he could. He was to somebody, he said he was determined to, to save some of his guys, just, you know, any of them would have been great. You know, to, it, after losing so many at Anzio and he, was, he wasn't going to lose 800 without trying to save at least a few of them, you know? And do you think at this point he was, dealing with a bit of survivor's guilt as well. I mean, you know, having been one of only two out of Anzio, you know, he, he, he'd, he'd ridden his luck. And, and I, I, do you think there was some sort of not death wish, but you know, I, I don't, why should I live? Why should I get out of this alive? Yeah, I think you're right there. Yeah. Um, I, I can't read his mind, but um, you know, he, there were several times he told me when it didn't seem at all possible that he or, he'd survived the war um the odds were just weren't where it weren't weren't good at all i mean um he, i think he's the well he was the only guy in e company the company commander from the 157th uh, third battalion he was the only guy to be still in combat at the end um everybody else had either been wounded or taken out or moved off the line sparks himself um several times in the war he'd look around and go like, this guy's been in combat for six months. He's out. I've got to get him a job as a cook or it doesn't matter. He was, he was very careful like that, very conscientious about realizing when other guys had had enough. And um, he, he definitely went beyond the point of, of being rational at certain points. Um, you know, I don't know whether you've seen it, Paul, but um, you know, there's a psychiatric report that was done by the U S army and, the fall of 1944 that found that the, the amount of time that you could actually spend in combat was around about 200 days. Yeah. And then you were, you're pretty much done. You were psychologically damaged. Um, you know, clinically, a lot of guys went nuts. They were insane. They had very bad PTSD, um, but they weren't, they weren't functioning at a hundred percent in any way. And plenty of guys carried on sparks carried on. He, and in the end spent over 500 days in combat. They carried on. That's the miracle of what, of their endurance, if you like, why we so admire them. But mm. it wasn't, they weren't all there all the time. And certain, at certain points they made decisions which were, they, they thought they were doing their best, but were, you know, were wrong or led to situations that they, they regretted later on. Sparks was a notoriously vociferous guy. He, 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 he blew a fuse. He didn't have much patience. This very short fuse at the end of the war, uh, especially when he was at Dachau, etc. The rest of his life, he was a, a, a bad-tempered geezer. You know, when I when I met him, he scared the hell out of me. He was a really grumpy old guy. Um, and uh, you know, the, the um, it's a, he said to me that you know it's not it's not hard to get promoted in a in a war. You just have to survive. You know that you know the. the you know, you become a you become a, 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 a major. You go from captain to major, lieutenant colonel. That happened to Sparks in about four, within about four months. And the reason for that is that if you've got any if you've got any finesse and competency as a combat commander, if you can deal with the stress and the if you can get your your, your stuff together and, and deal with it and carry on and survive and, and get things done, you might not be a superhero. You might not be winning every battle, but 
if you can get things done and you can be competent and you can lead mm -hmm. men in that situation, then you, you were promoted pretty quickly because, you know, um, even the a level of a battalion commander in um, certain battles, they, they were losing men like flies. And I don't, I'm not exaggerating. I'm writing a book right now about the 15th Infantry Regiment of the 3rd Division. The 3rd oh, right. Division spent almost the same amount of time, actually longer than the 45th in combat. And they went through three battalion commanders in, in, in three weeks in Italy in October and early November of 1943. So you're losing like really important officers on the ground that are responsible for getting battles won, for moving places. And then they're, they're getting killed because even a battalion commander like Sparks at Rypersweiler is close to the front and Sparks often went to the front. You, you have many examples where, you know, even if you're a lieutenant colonel, you really need to be at the front every now and again to see what the hell's going on. You can't, you can't trust certain things. You have to go forward and you have to look. You have to have a good look for yourself and also assess what's really happening at the front in terms of your men's morale, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's nothing better than a pair of eyes when mm. you're at the at the sharp end, you know. So yeah, I mean, my favourite bit in the in, in episode three was in fact the bit where General Frederick says because Sparks comes in and throws a wobbly I would say in my Essex because of the you know the fact they were exposed on that ridge and gets all angry with him yeah and the colonel there who I guess is sort of an amalgamation figure kind of says well we should throw the book at him and court martial him and, and Frederick says you know yeah but I can I I can't replace him I can replace you you're pretty good at what you do but I can replace you like that and that is a real key of moment of that January moment of 1945 there are staff officers coming out of the US Army's ears at that point now there are there are loads of just majors and captains who are good at doing their their job of organization but actual combat commanders who can lead men from the front they are yeah. getting really thin on the ground so Sparks is absolutely at that point like a like a hen's teeth isn't he you know, you, you you don't want to waste a guy like that on a courts martial yes no, a great photo of Frederick there that's Frederick, yeah, and it's a, you've got the Thunderbird patch on the shoulder there. Look, and uh, um, I don't, I've not come across an officer from World War II, an American officer that, that received as many Purple Hearts. So he had seven Purple Hearts. Wow, seven, um, two Silver Stars. He's like the only, the only, I think the only award he didn't get was the Medal of Honor. Um, very young, thirty-seven years old when he took out when he was uh, became a um, a one star. And he's, so he was the joint youngest U.S. Uh, general. There was Gavin and him, both the same age when they became mm -hmm. one stars. And, uh, you know, he was a, he was a badass. I mean, the, the irony is, is that, you know, when I interviewed Sparks before he died, he said he couldn't stand Frederick. He still had a lot of, still really resented in him and hadn't forgiven him for what happened to his battalion at Rypersweiler. And they, you know, in the, in the Liberator, the, 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 this TV show, they actually kind of they actually play down a little bit what happened between Sparks and and uh, Frederick wow. because you know you see in the scene uh, that he that Sparks loses his you know, loses his blob if you like uh, or goes has a bit of a wobbly but it wasn't a wobbly he screamed and shouted at him for quite a while and then and Frederick was seen to come out of the command post and he was red faced and Frederick was really really pissed off he's like how dare you who the hell do you think you are mate talking to me like that i'm not just some punk out of west point i've actually i'm actually one of arguably he didn't say this but we know he was one of the greatest combat generals of world war ii i would say he was you know you can find he's got to be up there isn't he i mean yeah, yeah incredible no guy. Yeah. i mean look what he did with the first special service force in yeah. uh in, in italy i mean those guys were freaking awesome and he led from the front. So, you know, he got moved from, from the first special service force to, um, to the 45th. And it was a different ball game. You know, a, a regular infantry division in those conditions was, was different to the force that he, much different situation, much different challenges. But Sparks didn't forgive him till the end, to the day he died. And I interviewed Sparks when he was in his late eighties, six months before he died. And he still couldn't stand Frederick. And I think it's a shame because you know, you had two guys that were very, pretty similar. I mean, Frederick mm. didn't suffer fools either. Um, but Frederick was kind of, you know, I found out that, 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 that Sparks was recommended for the Distinguished Service Cross for his actions at Rikers Island. 
Some people said that when he tried to save his guys, that that should have been, should have received the Medal of Honor for going way beyond the call of duty. Uh, it was this kind of situation where they had enough eyewitnesses and where it actually could have easily become a Medal of Honor. Um, in fact, after the war, there was a campaign to get Sparks uh, awarded the, the Medal of Honor for what happened at Rippers Valley. But Frederick, Frederick um, blamed Sparks for what happened at Rippers Valley. He said, they, you, shouldn't, you, should have been, he said you should have been with your guys when they were surrounded. Where were you? Now, that, that's a good question, but there was no way that Sparks could have been with them because they were, they'd pushed too far ahead. They'd gone too fast, too far, as he'd warned uh, mm. Frederick. Um, so that was kind of a that was kind of a crappy accusation to make, you know, to uh, you know to pile on the guilt to a guy that just lost his battalion, that carried out your orders, and then you turn around to the guy and say, "Well, wh why didn't you get killed or captured too? You, wh where were you?" And then Spart and Frederick went a step further, and he he nixed the DSC recommendation. So he said, "No, you know, Sparks is not going to get, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Sparks is not." Not worthy of the DSC, which was a shame because that that that, that action that Sparks carried out when he that actually did save three of his guys' lives and pulled them onto that tank and mm -hmm. you know bang 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 with a fifty cal for over an hour, he should have got the should have got a medal for that. So it just shows you that you know the the, 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 the relationships in in combat were not pretty often, and there was a lot of. Um, so there were a lot of situations where you could say that people were openly insubordinate and lost their rag, and it wasn't pretty. You know, you wouldn't yeah. get away with that in today's army, in the U.S. Army. No, today, but I mean, it, and it's big personalities, isn't it? You'd, it's, you'd, it's... you'd never have a spark. You'd never have any of those guys. You know. Well, we, we did the... a show last night with Mitch Yokelson about the airborne, the airborne oh, yeah, commanders, and of course, yeah. The, these kind of forces, like Colonel, like when he was Colonel Frederick in charge of the Special Service Force, they're finding a home in war. They would never, their careers wouldn't have progressed in peacetime that way. No way. They, they were, they no. were too, they were too rebellious. They were too forward thinking. The, the people yeah. who progress in peacetime are the ones who are really good at getting the accounts done and the fight. And that's a real sweeping generalization. It's not fair to people who serve their countries. But you know what I mean. It's the ones who yeah. know how to do all the skills. Yeah. In com in wars, it's the guys who are good at war who progress, isn't it? Yeah. Who are actually good at taking a, the units into the enemy and killing lots of enemy soldiers. And Frederick and Sparks, although obviously had this problem, they were both very good at that. They were both very oh, okay. good at killing yeah. enemy soldiers and just being damn good soldiers. And the fact that they they had this prickly um, uh, relationship, I think, is all the more interesting. I think also, and I think that the, the, your, both your book and the TV show touched on that, is that these units are full of of, of tension. The, the replacements aren't necessarily liked by the old guys. And the, that the Band of Brothers idea is a lovely idea. And then some units have this wonderful bond, but actually far more common is, is a kind of a, a friction amongst units. Um, but tell us about the father and son that, that were in the unit, because that, that is all, must be just about unique in World War II, isn't it? Um, well, you have that really good, um, that good uh, father and son relationship in episode three. So it's kind of a funny story because I, 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 um, I, uh, they optioned my book and I had, I had actually nothing to do with the show. So I said to them um, early on, you know, I've, I've been around you people in Hollywood for far too long. And um, basically all you want me to do is piss off and, and, and clap at the end, you know? So yeah. uh, if you've got any questions, just give me a call. Here's my number, and I'd be very happy to help out. You know, just any 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 questions. I never got the call. Um, they sent the check. Thank you. <laughs> and because uh, <laughs> that's what that's the only thing that really matters at the end of the day. <laughs> but uh, um, sorry. So when I saw it on the 11th of November, when it came out on the 11th of November, the four hours, I, I I had no idea what it looked like, what they'd done, you know, whatever they'd done. And I'm watching with my wife, and I get to the I get to the um, uh, halfway through the the, uh, the four hours, whatever. And suddenly I see this like this father and his son, and I'm like, what the hell? And there was there wasn't a father and son at um, at Rippersville, but there was a father and son uh, that were in the 158th artillery uh, unit that was attached to the 45th Infantry Division at Anzio. And in my book, there's a really very powerful, cool picture of father and son. I think they were called Roderick. Um, 
senior and junior. And um, there's a, the picture shows the father who's got this kind of gnarled, you know, really haggard face. And the son, who just looks like he's like 18, like an Audie Murphy type, you know. Um, and the caption was like, father says goodbye to his son and Enzio. And remarkably, what's really incredible is that the character in The Liberator, the Netflix show, the father and the son look really like the actual real guys that were, the, the father and son that were attached to the Thunderbirds. And I was like, wow, and so, is that just an accident? That's kind of crazy coincidence. And I found out that they, when they were casting it, they'd actually looked at my book, thank you, and they looked mm -hmm. at that photograph and they'd gone like, let's find some actors that look a little bit like the father and son that actually did exist. So, but yeah, no, it's um, the, the father and son thing uh, wasn't, didn't actually happen at Ripers Island, but there was a father and son, believe it or not, and the mm -hmm. father had served in World War I. Uh, God knows how he was still, still uh, eligible, because I think he had, if you were over 38, that was, that was it, you know? Yeah, um, yeah normally, yeah. But uh, yeah, so that was cool. That but was it gave it a bit of it gave it a bit of human interest in that episode. I mean, it, it, yeah, you know, it, it 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 like with all the things, you know, Seven and Pirate Ryan, even the ones that are authentic Band of Brothers, they move characters around, they they amalgamate yeah, sure, them. Yeah. It's just it's storytelling, isn't it? I I know exactly what you're talking about because I've there there's my book is 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 in the process of a script being written and i'm getting messages every week from the script writers and at the right at the beginning i said you cut like same thing you you kind of just want me to agree with what you say and they went well kind of you know but i said i'm going to draw my line on you can't put tiger tanks in don't you know <laughs> there's certain things i'm going to come down hard on but if you want to make the characters this that and the other you do what you want as long as i as long as i'm getting a credit somewhere that's fine it's uh yeah just don't just don't have tiger tanks but anyway so Talk about how, again, you were saying about when you first watched that show um, yourself, and it, it it does take a very, your book is excellent, but the book, like all books, there's lots of rabbit holes it goes down, condensing a book to four 45-minute episodes and making them palatable and making them understandable for a general audience. Of course, there's going to be little bits missing and things like that, but you know, you must be very happy with it and the feedback from it. Yeah, I was delighted. I mean, I, you know, I, I thought uh, Jeff Stewart, who was the creator of the show and he's the, the writer, um, I think he did a fantastic job. I, I, I emailed him and the other producers and said, you know, I'm not, I'm not BSing, but I loved it. I cried, I laughed, I, I, I was really moved by the show. And I think that one of the reactions that I've had from almost everybody that's got hold of me is that they really felt the emotion. They really... It was it was powerful. They it, it brought a lot of people to tears. They so the essence of Car of Sparks's character was there. I think they they printed him up a little bit too much. The actors, you know, obviously the guy that played Sparks was really handsome and something of a white knight. Um, so they they printed him up a little bit too much for my liking. But at the same time, they caught the nature of um, his deep commitment and his love for his man and what an essentially decent guy. He was. I mean, I my temptation would be always to be, to go really rough and dirty and make it really raw and ragged, and mm. people would be like, "Oh, I can't watch it at the moment of this." But because really, you know, it's a disgusting, horrible, awful, traumatizing thing. War. Uh, we've never been in it, thank God. Um, I'm not sure whether I'd even want to write about it if I had been seen the real yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's a you know, it it's so that that was that was something that was kind of. Um, was interesting, you know, and uh, but going back to your point, Jeff Stewart, the guy that wrote the show, he's a he's a really awesome writer, and you know, I don't just say that because he, he adapted my book. He did a really good job. Um, he picked out, you know, key points that I, as a writer, um, took a long time to choose those dramatic moments. So he kind of amplified them, and I that made me feel good because I'm like, well, okay, that that was a good idea then to choose that mm. sequence or that opening or that narrative arc, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, Jeff Stewart, he worked on Die Hard and he did The Fugitive and he's now the um, the executive producer, the showrunner for The Vikings, the new Vikings show coming out. So this guy's been around. He knows how to tell a story, doesn't he? I mean, yeah, that, when, he, when, when the news came out, I whether it was you who announced it was going to be made into a show or it, I read it somewhere, Twitter, Facebook, and I I, I went through the book again. I'd, I'd, I'd had the book and I, I looked, and I thought the, the – 
the difficulty was is the lack of continuity of characters going all the way through it apart from Felix Sparks himself because they were almost wiped out to a man Anzio because they were almost yeah. wiped out again you don't have those I'm going to kind of reference Band of Brothers you don't have those kind of Don Malarkeys that were there all the way from the beginning to the end apart from Sparks and I thought but can one character carry the entire four episodes and, and yes he did and I think maybe that's maybe they had a very strong identifiable actor because it had to it had he had to carry the whole thing on his shoulders didn't he much like sparks had to carry the whole war on yeah. his shoulders I at mean, the time the tv show had to all be about him you get a couple other characters who come in and out of it but it really was that a single character wasn't it yeah i mean you know to give them to give jeb stewart his due he had to do that with sparks and he did do it very well but you know he did bring in two composite characters that, you know, there's the Native American. So there's a three, it's a, a, a trio really that yeah. you look at a lot of the time. And that trio is Sparks, obviously. But then you have uh, a Native American and you also have a Hispanic American. Um, so the, the point of that, I believe, was not just because they wanted to make it a global product and appeal to Hispanics and to not just have a white face of victory and combat, which is, you know, my one big thing about a lot of World War II movies is that they don't, they have never really shown uh, the true racial complexion of the US Army, let alone the, the British Army, my God. You well, know? yeah, the, the, the Indian um, Army, the Gurkhas, yeah, the, yeah the, the, don't, don't get us started. Yeah, yeah. When are we going to see a really good movie about Gurkhas in World War II? I, I'd like to, It'd be nice. Yeah. You know, they're legendary. Is there one? I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Um, we'll see. So that was a that was a deliberate ploy, uh, as much marketing as it was also um, based on a decision that Jeb Stewart made, which was that he wanted to do something a little bit different in terms of, of World War Two. Um, you know, he wasn't into making a uh, Band of Brothers Mark Two. He saw that the the truth of the complexion of the regiment was that there were an awful lot of Native Americans and an awful lot of Hispanic Americans in the, the company and then the regiment and the battalion that that uh, Sparks was a part of. And he said, well, you know, I want to, this is something that's fresh and hasn't been shown before. And I really want to show a Native American, you know, kicking the ass out of the Nazis in, in yeah. World War II. And I want to show these minorities winning World War II in an American uniform, but not being, you know, lily white, not being, you know, Aryan Americans. Well, I, think, I think that's a very good point because you know, going back to the real history, the 45th Division, as you said, was made up lots of Oklahomans and, te and Texans yeah. and lots of Hispanics, yeah. lots of Native Americans, lots of people. And I think they have over the years in the general histories been rather avoided as a unit. I think we focused on the big red one, the 29th, and maybe the sexier units. And I think the 45th is a really fascinating unit. And so when you were studying, going back to the book, let's leave the TV show aside a bit. When you were studying that and sparked his men, what do you think was it was about that, the 157th and the division as a whole that made them a little bit different? Was it that ethnic diversity that gave them some kind of strength uh, strength because everybody else was against them they fought together better was it something like that um i think it was sparks that led me to the story um originally just uh, that the power of his story and the fact that um he went all the way that he was at dachau at the end that he was the commanding officer of the first americans to liberate the most notorious camp concentration camp not death camp in mm. the third reich it was his odyssey and his character that led me into this it got me excited about the story in the first place. I couldn't, I couldn't work out how to tell the story for a long time. For several years, I, I interviewed Sparks and then couldn't get a book deal, couldn't work out how to get a book deal. But um, once I started looking into the men and the story of the 157th, I, it was very notable that, you know, um, they were not an all white, they were not your, your stereotypical American for big red one, you know, the cut eyes. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's because of, as you said, that's it's, it's very simple. They were drawn from four states in the U.S. Southwestern states: Colorado, New Mexico, um, you know that that uh, Oklahoma, that area, parts of Texas, etc. And there was a combination of cowboys. Uh, over fifteen hundred Native Americans left America with the forty fifth Infantry Division, which is like you know it's a very large, it's the largest number of, of any U.S. division. Uh, and there were uh, Mexican-Americans that Sparks 
uh, commanded that couldn't speak English very well. They had to get their mates to write their V their V-grams and their mail back home because they couldn't speak English properly. So, you know, um, and I remember that Sparks in an interview with me said that, you know, he worried, he was very worried in, at Salerno, September 1943, he arrives just after the battle's really concluded, um, the crisis is over and he's, uh, for the first time, he's a company commander in combat and he's wondering, you know, are these 200 guys, I've got, I've got an awful lot of Mexican-Americans. And when I was a kid in Arizona, they treated these guys like dirt. I mean, they, they didn't give them jobs. They were really racist. It's like, why the hell would they fight for Uncle Sam? And I remember him saying to me, I was like sitting there going, are these guys going to really put their line on for a country that, that, that treats them like second-class citizens or worse? Uh, you know, when he was um, fir first joined the regiment back in Fort Sill, that's episode one in the series, it's true that they had signs on bars outside Fort Sill, no Indians, no Mexicans. Uh, and yet... Those Indians and those Mexicans were were amazing. And Sparks said that after the first day in combat with these guys, he was like, "Wow, they're they're just as good as everybody else." In fact, they kind of, in, in some ways, they were better. They were they were angrier. They were fiercer. They were tougher. They were. Um, so I think that that aspect of it that it was like this group of of um, Americans that you know Native Americans, for example, had just had, had, had suffered enormous genocide. Mm. within three or four generations they've like just almost wiped out by the white americans well yet, it's a truck it's, it's turner turnbull and normally yeah. who i talk, we talk about nerve yeah. plan you know he he's his great great grandfather might have been great grandfather or great great anyway turner turnbull's great grandfather was the choctaw chief who'd led the the choctaws on the trail of tears Right, how yeah. many decades yeah. ago where they nearly all died right. because of treatment and then there he is on d-day as these guys are in italy and in, in in france and germany fighting for a country that as you say just a couple of generations earlier was was killing them i mean that with, yeah. without any kind of apology they vermin it, it, it's a staggering uh, um um situation and that's why i think the strongest thing about the liberator is it's a, especially now especially where we are we're not going to politics but we're split we need to be brought I, together again we need to be reminded <laughs> that we're all different colors and beliefs and right yeah. we all have a this core idea of working together for a common good and i think that that's what the 40 yeah that's like a, represented I, I think it's really important uh, but I, I do think that we are going to be neglectful if we don't talk about um, fascism and we don't talk about what we defeated because I, I've made this point several times uh, in the last year you know with the, the Black Lives Matter issues and um, basically the, the, the rapid disintegration of any notion of unity in America I mean that's just like that's a nostalgic pipe dream um, I think America's fundamentally broken uh, it breaks my heart I've been writing for 20 25 years about working class Americans that earned the United States of America the greatest kudos and respect of any generation. And uh, they would be, I think they'd all be turning in their graves right now. I'm, in Normandy, there's nine and a half thousand, I think a hell of a lot of them be turning in their graves to think that Nazis, guys with uh, Auschwitz symbols on their shirts, that, that neo-Nazis would be storming the capital there. You know, these guys would be... <laughs> It's insane, be isn't it? Emboldened, enraged, and like you know, encouraged by the United States president. It's yeah. a pathetic and tragic outcome. Sorry, but it is. And no, I do right. really feel strongly, Paul, that you know, we talk about the greatest generation, we talk about World War II, and but we don't actually think that, you know, we, we don't actually dare ourselves to think that maybe maybe that period under Roosevelt from 1933 to 1945 and the post-into the 40s, maybe that was an anomaly in American history. Maybe that's when they actually, that's, that's not, that's the anomaly. That's the chapter. That's the good chapter, you know, where well, they well, went I, I, I hope to things can get better. I, you know, lynch I think... each other and hang each other and kill each other in a civil war and what they're doing now. It's, a, you know, sorry, but. No, you're, you're, at, you're absolutely right. When um, you look at the long trajectory, American history is an extremely violent history. I think Brits can't understand that. I've been in this country for a very, very long time and I'm not pontificating now. I am, but I don't care. But it is a violent history. You look at it's like it's like Mexico. You go to Mexico, you look at the history. It's like just bloodbath after bloodbath after. You know, still is a very violent country. Some countries are very violent and they're full of conflict. 
Um, you well, know, that's so... that quote in The Third Man, isn't it? I'm going to remember a movie quote now is when I'm Orson Welles and Joseph Cotton and, I, and Orson Welles is explaining, he say, he says, Switzerland has had peace for 500 years and they've created yeah. a cuckoo clock and, and whatever. <laughs> Italy has had wars every generation of five years and they yeah. gave us the Renaissance and the Da Vinci. And I think maybe the best thing has come out of countries in adversity. Maybe you have to go through that violence to, be, to, 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 to prosper. But we're going off on a side. I want to bring you back yeah. to the fact after, after the, the, the battles in the Vosges Mountains, you said it early on, the, 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 the 45th Division, Felix Sparks, ended up in Dachau. And there were there was some real problems there of, of, of anger spilling over amongst some of the men um do you think there's any particular connection with the fact as you say there there were native americans there were mexicans they had experienced that kind of prejudice and and maybe it was a chance to kind of get their own back a bit for several decades of of, of abuse i don't what's your take on what was going on in dachau um well you know they they basically saw such horrific things that they broke they most of them were broken already and you know, when you see thousands of bodies just lying there, rotting in the spring sun, and you, you, and you, you, Sparks said himself that he'd seen everything, but this is something you just couldn't get, the, the human mind couldn't get around. It was like so dark, so horrific. Mm -hmm. You know, 2,000 2, odd bodies lying on a, on a, in boxcars on a train before they even got into the camp, you know? Um, so I think they were, they were, they were ready to, to react anyway. And they, they, the first reaction was kind of, anger and grief and then some of them became cold-blooded um killers they were they wanted to meet out vengeance they, this was something that was like had to be punished and um they did um so it does it does raise this issue which is kind of interests me which is that um some some societies are more indoctrinated and more brutalized than others before they send young men into into combat and the nazi regime had had uh, had brainwashed and had done a pretty good job of um, of brutalizing and um, and turning a lot of young Germans into killers and uh, with not much sort of sense of social conscience. Um, and that, you know, Roosevelt said that the average citizen soldier in World War II, certainly in Europe, the GI liberator, it came from the ways of peace and democracy. And the big, the big concern all the way through World War II, right to the very end, uh, Eisenhower felt it, Marshall, uh, Patton, Bradley, you name it, was that the American soldier was too soft, that they weren't brutal killers, that they had to be trained to kill. I've just been reading a, um, uh, an account uh, by a guy called George Biddle, an artist, is a War Department artist, and he was with the 3rd Division, the 15th Infantry Regiment of the 3rd Division in Italy, and he's with a battalion commander called Tofi, from the 15th Infantry Regiment, and Tofi's sitting there one night, they're drinking wine, candlelight, in a cave in southern Italy. And he's like, you know, the big problem we have is that these boys don't want to kill anybody. They're soft. They don't want to kill anybody. We have to, it takes a while to get them to kill the enemy. And the Germans aren't like that. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't need to be taught how to kill. It, when their buddies are being killed around them, they kill, but we still have a problem. I mean, I think it was S.L. Marshall that did a, a, um, a really good study just after the war yep. uh, called Men Under Fire. And he, he showed that, you know, less around about a third of Yanks, even when they were in a firefight where the bullets were whizzing past them, they didn't return fire. They didn't yeah. fire their M1s. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't fire back, even when they could, even when they were like, it was fire back. It was kill or yeah. be killed. There was a big thread still, on Twitter about that today. There was a, a British astronomer was talking it. about that. Fascinating yeah. stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, no, it, it is. It is. That is the case. I mean, I remember I'm name dropping now. I, I, was, I was talking to Max Hastings a few years ago, and he was talking about the same thing is that when he was writing his early books, he was in his 30s, you know, he's in his 70s now. He realized uh, that we allies never became the thing we were trying to defeat. And that was to our credit. In that yeah. although because we were a bit softer because we were a little bit less keen to go and kill it took us a little bit longer to get to the victory 
if we had been a bit more German, we might have got that victory swifter, but we would have become the thing we were trying to defeat. And it was a really interesting point. I thought, you know, that's that's very deep. That, but, you know, my my granddad, my grand, my great uncle who were here, and they wanted they wanted to get it over and done with and go back home. They they didn't yeah. have any interest in doing it long term. They just wanted to get it done and go back home. And and yeah. frankly, when they were asking the volunteers to run over and knock out the machine gun, they were all hoping someone else was going to volunteer. That was kind oh, of oh yeah, totally. Man. And there's nothing I mean, wrong with that. I would be exactly the same i I, yeah. i'd be hoping someone else steps up and you know yeah i do my job i think but i wouldn't want to do more than my job and i think yeah I'd, you know, I'd say i'd say to the guy with the posh accent from eaton you go first sir i'll be right behind you yeah exactly but let's let's bring it we've been a lovely chat Ali. let's bring it back to the to what was happening 75 years ago today so when when felix pulls the the remainder of his battalion and they were ordered they were under strength when they went in went into those mountains and they come out and they're they've you know they've been men been captured they've been wounded what was his state of mind then i mean you spoke to him and you said you said he was very scary but you know was that his absolutely lowest point in the war or was that yeah definitely the lowest yeah point? i mean anzio was bad he was very affected by that but um Definitely after Riper's Viola, he was heartbroken. He said he, he could never, he never got over it. He never recovered from that. And I think he had massive survivor's guilt. This is my view. You know, I think he had massive survivor's guilt. How could you not? I think he was angry. I think he was deeply, deeply scarred by that. Um, and I think that he felt that he'd lost, I think he lost 18 platoon leaders. I mean, he lost that those, imagine how many lieutenants, how many, staff sergeants, how many young leaders of other men you've had in a battalion and you've lost that battalion. Mm. So he felt very responsible, very angry. And I don't think he ever really, I think it colored the rest of his life. You know, I think that he always had a problem with authority. He always had a problem with power being exerted without moral clarity. Um, and I think it um, left him very scarred, definitely. Mm. Yeah, very, very wounded on many, on, in well, so I many think... different ways. Going back yeah. to the the fact that it's a rather forgotten battle, he would have spent decades with it never turning up in books. I mean, it never it, it just didn't. Yeah. That campaign never turned up in the general history. And I'm going back yeah. to the you know the Max Hastings and the Stephen Ambrose and the John Keegans and all those people. You never got that campaign. It was always the Ardennes. It was there, and then and then it skipped to the crossing of the Rhine. There was that yeah. January to kind of March period was just kind of it jumped over. It was like well, if you want to if you want to if you want to look at the classic. Um, campaign that begins uh just uh you know within within weeks of of this um it's the colmar pocket now i, I say yeah. colmar pocket you know about the colmar pocket but not many people know about the colmar pocket and you you go and talk to third id veterans not many around but there are some and you ask them what the toughest fighting in world war ii was they'd say it was the colmar pocket yeah you know where you know the guy next to you were hugging the guy next to you because you needed the body warmth to survive the night and um you're up against the ss and the ss have the backs to the rhine and they don't want to budge and they're going to fight like furies and they did so there are many many um episodes in world war ii that haven't been turned into movies or haven't been written about yeah great and uh you know call my pocket ripers viola these North Operation Northwind, these are examples of them, you know? Exactly, and it's why I like to do these little shows like that. And I, right at the beginning when I started doing these TV shows, I, I I was told, you know, you should do more um, more, more Rangers, more 101st Airborne, more SAS, more... The, and I go, I will do some of them, but I really want to spread it out. I really want to yeah. cover the Shell Estuary and and uh, and the Rose Mountains and and Hong Kong. I did a show on Hong Kong a few couple of weeks ago oh, because cool. the war is more than just those famous accounts. And I think maybe things like Band of Brothers, Seven Pride Run, bring people into the interest in the military history. But I then hope they spread out sideways and they go in, look at the Colmar Pocket and the Canadian First Army in the Shelt Estuary and things like that. And yeah. uh, and uh, and uh, you know, what was happening in the 14th Army in Burma, for example, because all of these things were happening concurrently. But there is so much. Fun. I see it myself. If someone does on Twitter and Facebook, if they talk about you know, the hundred and first air boom, 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 thousands of comments. You talk about the third division, American division, you talk about the British 53rd Welsh division. It, it gets so much less interest. So I think, you know, this is why we need to spread out and understand some of these campaigns because they were just horrible. Colmar pocket is a very good example. Yeah. Hergen forest is another one, you know, from, from November, December, you know, well, the question, question I have for you, Paul is if they hadn't made the HBO series band of brothers, 
who would give a damn about the 101st Airborne? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's true. I mean, I remember when I was coming to Normandy back in my I team. I mean, John Wayne in the longest. It was all eighty second. Yeah, it was all eighty second. That's all you've got. You, you don't you don't own World War Two. Yeah. Two two Medal of Honors received by the 101st Airborne, 117 days on the line. The third division that were in the Colmar pocket that I'm writing about now, 40 Medals of Honor, 635 days on the line, eight times more casualties, seven times more fatalities. And yet it's like the TV show called Band of Brothers. And that's the whole, uh, that's Second World War to most people. Yeah. So what you're and doing is not that we're really criticizing good. Band of Brothers. What it does, it does ah, very well. That, I will. And the, I'll yeah. openly criticize it. <laughs> but my bookshelf behind me, my 506th regiment shelf is two ah. shelves. Okay. You know, I mean, that's because you ha have to keep up with everything for tours and stuff. <laughs> I I've got only one shelf on the British Army in Northwest Europe. So I've got <laughs> twice as much as many yeah. books on one regiment of one division than I have yeah. on an entire army in Northwest Europe. And that is, yeah. that is something that needs addressing. And I think, you know, the, the, the more people like, you know, kudos to you, Alex, for writing about the third division, kudos to people like Jonathan Ware, a friend of mine writing about the 50th, 53rd Welsh, Edwin yeah. in, in Holland, trying to uh, pay attention to the first Canadian army. Cause we need, when people bite and they start reading about these actions, they are just as fantastic, just as amazing, with just as many colourful heroes, just as many incredible actions as, as the ones we know about. It's just people have got to be prepared to go off menu a bit, haven't they, and say, OK, there's other, there are other truces than the 101st Airborne to read about. And that's not that we're criticising the 101st Airborne. It's just, you know, spread out, read about other things. Anyway. This has been great, Alex. I've enjoyed talking to you. Um, I can't wait for to you to come on and talk about when you've got this third division book finished because that'll be a real cracker. That's um, yeah. I'm hoping that hoping the um to get it done fairly soon. Um, so it should be published in the fall. I, I hope. Fingers crossed. You know. Super. Um, but yeah, great, great, great guys. I'm, I'm I'm writing about four guys that received the Medal of Honor. From that division, including obviously Audie Murphy. Audie Murphy, yeah. I watched Helen back a couple of weeks ago. Actually, I just I hadn't watched yeah. it for years. Yeah, can you believe he played himself in his own own book? And he you still know? looks young, doesn't he? Even though it was ten yeah. years old, he still looks young. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, without going on about it, I, I just got sent like a couple of days ago um, the uh, the uh, some film footage and uh, Signal Corps footage. From when Murphy received the Medal of Honor, which was the second of June, nineteen forty-five, and he looks like he's sixteen. And literally, you know, I I used to smoke ten packs of Woodbines and drink cider when I was fifteen and sixteen, but but Audie Murphy obviously didn't. So even at fifteen, I looked older than he did at twenty-one. You know? Yeah. Yeah, he was he was crazy young, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, anyway, we're, we're digressing. Well, anyway, thank you very much, Alex, for joining me. It's always good talking My to pleasure. you. My pleasure, thank you. You can come on thank whenever you, you want much. to talk about other things, and uh, I don't yeah. care that we had a little bit of a political uh, uh, discussion about there. I think it needs to be said every now and then. It's uh, Yeah. The, the, these well, guys what, gave what us... What do you a... think? Why, why do they think... Why, why do people think that 140,000 or odd... Americans died to liberate Europe because they were they were they, were, they wanted they didn't like Mussolini. It's because they were defeating fascism, yeah. racism, genocide, neo Nazis. Not not the neo Nazis that are storming the capital now. The neo Nazis, the original ones, the real ones. Yeah, yeah, the ones that killed over thirty million civilians in Europe. That that committed the, the fastest genocide, killed more people more quickly than anybody else in history. That's who we were defeating, and we yeah. shouldn't mess about or piss about and call Nazis anything but evil. So Absolutely. Right World on, War brother. II That's actually It's about right. reminding yeah. people of what we defeated and why people gave their lives. What's Absolutely. the point? Why are you here? Why am I here? Unless we remind people of the evil that we defeated. They weren't heroes for us because they won a war. They were heroes because they defeated evil, yeah. fascism. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, the, the only Sorry. black and white war in the last couple of I'm years. I'm tired it? of it. It's like, Christ, you know, why, why do you love the Band of Brothers? Why do you love the 101st Airborne? They, you know, they're not in Vietnam. You don't, you don't have TV shows and movies about the 101st Airborne in Vietnam. It's because they're liberating people from evil and oppression in Europe in World War II and defeating fascism. And we all forget that way too often. And we need to remember it so that we can make sure that we aren't defeated by fascism again because it looks bloody popular in this country right now. 75 million Americans voted for a fascist. 
If it wasn't well, for COVID, I, I, I'm, I'm clearly, kind of, if it I'm, wasn't for COVID, I'd be living in a fascist country right now. I'm, I'm going to have to be careful because I, I know some of my supporters are going to be on both sides well, of the debate. But yeah, I'm kind of with you, Alex. But anyway, if you can't call a spade a spade, you can't call Trump a fascist right now. Uh, you, you need to go and read a few history books. No, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm not a fan at all, and I lose friends all the time on yeah. Facebook for for just trying to say something. But you know, it's a crazy world, and. Um, yeah, let's hope it gets better. Anyway, thank you very much, Alex, for joining me. We'll have you on again very soon. For those watching, don't forget, tomorrow we've got Marty Morgan. We're going to be unraveling the mysteries of what actually happened in San Marigli's on June the 6th. Um, I'll see you all tomorrow. Don't forget to check out Patreon page. Check out our links and things below. Go and check out Alex's books. Go and check out The Liberator if you haven't watched it on Netflix. And I'll see you all again on World War II TV very shortly. Thank you very much for watching, everybody. Cheers. Goodbye. <laughs>